All right, now I think we're ready for the statement of the implicit function theorem, though we'll hold off on the proof until later. So the theorem, and we'll again state this in a pictorial manner so that it's a little bit more digestible uh, when you read the precise assumptions of the theorem. So again, what we're going to have is another a picture just like the one we had before for that pre-implicit function theorem. And we'll be focusing on um, a subset. Uh, this time, for convenience of the proof, which we won't get to now, but later, let's set up the notation so that instead of calling our domain u, we'll call it a1. And our range on which the function uh, is going to be defined is a1 cross a. So again, we have this um, we have this rectangle, which is just the cross product of two open subsets here. This is R k, and this is R. Um, let's call this R. Uh, let's say this is R n. So that's R n. And the setup is we still have this function f. But this time, the codomain of this function is not just going to be Rm, but it's also going to be Rn. It's the only difference uh, so far between the two setups. And we will also assume that instead of having some function g, we're actually going to derive a function g from this. That's what the implicit function theorem states. We're going to look at, uh, we have a point in A1, let's call it A, and a point in A2, let's call it B, and that point lies in this rectangle here. So we have A comma B. And the assumption is, is that under the evaluation of this function on this input AB, we actually land at zero. So F of A comma B is assumed to be 0. In addition, we also make the assumption, and by the way, this is also a continuously differentiable function, or in general, a function of class CR for some R. And in addition, besides just this assumption, we also assume that the determinant of the restriction of f to one of its coordinates is, is non-zero. So we explicitly assume that the determinant of the differential and th that, sorry, and that coordinate is exactly this vertical coordinate here. So it's dB of, and we can't apply the function f because that's meaningless. f is a function from rk cross rn. What we have to do is we have to use those inclusion functions, those when we included the planes and the lines, we have to use the inclusion of this axis into here exactly at this point AB. So we're drawing that line going through here and we're looking at the value of the function along that line. So as long as the determinant of the differential of the function f composed with psi a is non-zero, then And now here's where we get to the claim of the theorem. So if you notice, we didn't assume anything about any other function in this statement. All we're assuming is that the derivative of f the, has um, non-zero determinant when we restrict to um, this plane that cuts through the point um, a, b. So let's just, you know, just to be clear, this is a linear transformation from rn to rn. So the determinant makes sense. Let me redraw this picture, and we still have this function f. The claim is that there exists a subset of A, let's call it B. So A was maybe somewhere, A maybe included like this region here, A1. So we have a subset B and a function g from b to rn. So again, we have this function g. There exists 
in fact, well, it's, it, not only does this function exist, but it'll be unique satisfying certain conditions, and we'll say what those are in a moment. There exists a function g from some domain in B whose value is contained all in A2. So g of A1 is contained in A2. So we can draw this function. Let's say it looks something like this. Such that g of A, so here now we're seeing uh, the properties that make this function unique. So there exists a unique g and a domain b from b to rn such that g of a is equal to b, g of a1 is contained in a2. There are a lot of conditions actually. G is of class CR, so it's of the same class as F. And finally, more you know, related to the previous theorem we had, G is the graph, so actually let me write it this way, F of the graph of G, which is written as X comma GX, is equal to zero for all X in the domain B. So if we compare the two theorems, this theorem and the theorem we had before, this was one of the assumptions in the theorem, and then we essentially just studied the properties of what the differential looked like. Here we're saying something way stronger, that we, if we have this assumption that the derivative does not vanish, even though the value of the function at this point is zero, then we can show that there's some domain on which we can define a function and its value under applying the function f is also zero. So this is the statement of the theorem that there exists such a function and not only does it exist satisfying these properties, it's the only function that satisfies these conditions. Let's just look at a simple example to figure out what are these functions f, g, what is everything in a simple example. So let's say f is a function of two variables and it's given by x squared plus y squared minus 5. First, let's look at what are the set of points x, y for which the value of this function is 0. So f of x, y equals 0 for all, well, x, y satisfying this equation, right? for all x, y um, such that x squared plus y squared minus 5 equals 0, i.e. x squared plus y squared equals 5. So this is just describing a circle of radius square root of 5 at the origin. So let me uh, draw that, let's say here. And what we'll do is, um, this statement says that if I take any point at which the value of this function is zero, and if the dif differential of that function when I restrict it to this vertical axis is non-zero, then I should be able to find such a function. So. Let's pick the point, because I know this point will work, and we'll look at a point at which this does not work in a moment. Let's pick the point 1, 2. So let's say AB is equal to 1, 2. So that point's somewhere around here. The differential of F, in general, for an arbitrary XY, is given by, at least the matrix associated to it, is given by 2x and 2y. So in particular, at the point 1, 2, the differential is 2, 4. What's the differential of 
this function, this is the total differential of the whole function f, but what about when we restrict to um, the second coordinate? So let's look at d. b here is 2. We're looking in the y-axis now, and we're applying the function f to psi a, and a is 1. So let's just be totally clear about what this even means. So this is the function, so f composed with psi 1. We're thinking of restricting f to the second variable. So that means its input is y. So this gets sent to 1 comma y. And f at 1 comma y is equal to you plug in 1. If this x, I would have written x here, I would have gotten exactly the same equation here. It would have just been f at xy. So this is 1 plus y squared minus 5. So what's the derivative of this function? What's the differential of this function? And you can check that the differential of this is exactly just 4. It's the 1 by 1 matrix whose entry is 4. So it satisfies this condition because 4 is non-zero and the determinant of a 1 by 1 matrix is exactly just the entry of that matrix. So we should be able to find the function g. So that means what we should be able to do is we should be able to find some domain here, some small enough domain. All the statement says is that there exists such a domain. It doesn't tell us how big it is. And a function g whose graph agrees with the zero set of this function and includes that point. And not only does this function exist, but it also has to be continuous. And in fact, since this is infinitely differentiable, the claim of the theorem says that this function will also be infinitely differentiable. So here's there's going to be some function g, and this here is the graph of g. And now it might make a lot more sense what that function is. g of x should be what we're doing is we're solving for the variable y in terms of the variable x. And if we go through the math here, we'll see that this is given by the square root of 5 minus x squared. This is the function g, and the domain x, well, actually it works for all points on the entire um, domain up until... Um, well, it works everywhere up until you reach the um, up until the point where you reach the boundary. So to be safe, let's make that the open set that doesn't contain the boundary endpoints. And you might um, complain and say, "Well, actually, um, I can find another function that satisfies all of these conditions too." I think. And why don't you just take the function that takes the values for all, for all elements um, in the domain that are less than 1 to be up here, and then why not go this way? And then I'll obtain all the elements um, x get mapped to this function here, which would be minus square root of 5 minus x squared. That's a completely valid function. It satisfies the first condition. Second, well, second condition, yeah, it satisfies the second condition too if we assume that um, A2 is all of R. And, oh, does it satisfy this condition? I don't know. Probably not, right? It's not continuous, so it fails the condition that um, it's not continuous. And this one it satisfies too because the value when I apply F to this function is also zero. So it, it's very crucial um, in the statement of this uniqueness theorem that we include every single one of these assumptions. And only when we include all of these assumptions do we indeed get a unique function. So this just gives us an explicit example of realizing the statement of this theorem, of the implicit function theorem, by our usual intuition of what it means by solving a particular equation 
of one variable in terms of the other. This is the formal way of stating that claim.